Okay, so uh, for today, I wanted to talk about an overarching view of our coastal management uh, stressors and challenges and uh, in ways to, to think about um, these things we're attempting to improve upon and, and deal with. So the overall, uh, one of the overall themes as we go to the rest of the semester is um, has the coastal zone become too complex? Is it, is it just gotten too crazy and too, too many people and too many interests and you know, blah, 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 yeah. to, to effectively manage, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So I have a vote for yes, it has been. It's, it's hard, it's hard, right? It's insane, it's crazy. Um, and so, uh, so that's the answer, that's too hard to imagine. So um, we can think about this in a couple different ways, or a few different ways. Um, we could talk about the natural world, we can talk about our own behaviors, and we can talk about the societal conventions and institutions that we craft to, to try to uh, um, have agency in these, in these places. So, so breaking that up, so taking this, this overarching question and, and uh, coloring it slightly differently in the different context is, has the natural world become too dynamic or too unpredictable for us to understand it and therefore you know, manage it? Is, it? is it the case that the, the hurricanes are just coming so crazily we don't know what's going on? B, is it that we, may, we might be uh, too unimaginative to figure out how to change our behaviors or to, to create other social incentives or something of like that nature? And then third, have our institutions either become too afraid to make bold uh, decisions or just don't have the power to have a strong effect on some of our coastal management challenges. So those are all, those are three different versions of this overarching question, um, all of which are potentially valid. So let's take a couple examples here. So this, these, are all, these are all historic quotes and these initial ones are all historic quotes about uh, fishing and fisheries. Um, and so this is from 1812, uh, and it's on the East Coast. But the fishing banks, talking about the banks off of New England, the fishing banks are an inexhaustible source of wealth, and the fishing business is a most excellent nursery for seamen. It therefore deserves every encouragement and indulgence from an enlightened legislature, saying that, hey, we should do everything we can to exploit this particular resource. And uh, 1818, uh, this is the famous Lord Byron poet. Um, roll on, thou deep, dark ocean, roll. 10,000 feet swept, sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops at the shore. Another very deeply embedded thing that we can, we can mess up the forest or whatever, but the ocean is just this all-powerful thing. We can't possibly, whatever we do, won't have an impact on this place. Huxley in 1884 says, probably the greatest sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say, nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish. That's 1884. Um, by 1995, in the inexhaustible sea, um, we have, as yet we do not know the ocean well enough. Much must still be learned. Nevertheless, we are already beginning to understand that what it has to offer extends beyond the limits of our imagination that someday men will learn that in its bounty, the sea is inexhaustible. So still, a century later from those quotes, still, it's this thing that we're never going to be able to soil, that's always going to be rocking and rolling, always going to be um, providing uh, the resources for us. Around that same time, though, we were starting to hear the, the warning signs. And so Rachel Carson is, um, we all think of Rachel Carson as, um, as Rachel Carson of, um, Silent Spring and of pesticides in DDT, which is super, super important. But she really got famous first writing about the coast and the ocean. And so she wrote three books, and this is from one of those first three, called The Sea Around Us. And she says in 1951, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose, arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though, changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. So not that the ocean is going to go away, but these resources within the, and these populations within the ocean um, are being threatened by us. 
And then a modern day uh, fisherman also on the East Coast. Most fishermen think that Mother Nature brought us, he's talking about the fisheries, brought us fisheries, um, took them away, and that Mother Nature will bring them back again, right? That we, we're, just, we're just pawns here. We're just, we're bouncing around and it's all Mother Nature's doing. Um, the fishermen think that God brought us the oysters and that God took them away. I think that God brought us the oysters and people took them away, which is a more modern, uh, sophisticated, mature take on stuff. Um, uh, another example of this, of this stuff, uh, we, there's all, all types of insights you can get from looking at different literature. Here's an example from Noir. So this is from Ross McDonald's Drowning Pool, and it's about this detective, and he's having all this, this crazy stuff, and then he's stressed out, so he goes and he floats in the ocean off Santa Monica. And he looks back and he says, I turned on my back and floated, looking up at the sky, nothing around me but the cool, clear Pacific, nothing in my eyes but long blue space. It was as close as I ever got to cleanliness and freedom, as far as I ever got from all the people. They jerry-built the beaches from San Diego to the Golden State, or to the Golden Gate, bulldozed super highways through the mountains, cut down a thousand years of redwood growth, and built an urban wilderness in the desert. They couldn't touch the ocean. They poured their sewage into it, but it couldn't be tainted. There was nothing wrong with Southern California that a rise in ocean level wouldn't cure. All right, so that was 75 years ago. So this is sort of a blending of this idea that the ocean is super powerful and we are uh, causing some issues. Ultimately, ultimately the source for our challenges here in terms of um, uh, our resource management challenges in the coastal zone um, is uh, our humanity, is our human footprint, our human activity. And that's sort of two major flavors, right? One is the quantity, the gross number of people um, on the planet, but in and around, in and around uh, uh, the world. And then the intensity, the, the intensity with which we consume resources. So the quantity and the intensity with which we are interacting with the natural world. And we can see that in all different types of ways. And you guys know this from all your other classes. This is another uh, uh, light map of humanity in the continental United States. Um, we can talk about all the different <clears throat> markers of the Anthropocene that are coming up and everything is, or just about everything is going in a not good direction. Ozone is going in a good direction, but everything else is going in a typically bad direction. Okay, so I gave you before eras of coastal um, conceptualization, how we think about our rhetoric, right? We talk about the coastal imaginary, the coastal dystopiary, the coastal inclusionary, those things in terms of a rhetorical sense. Let's talk for a few minutes about these eras of coastal challenges. So the eras of us interacting with, with resources and landscapes and seascapes and how those have changed over time. So we can talk about deep history back in the day, way back in the day. We can talk about an era of expanding human influence, which goes up to about 1500-ish. And that then we move into the uh, colonial era where we have empires, mostly from Europe, uh, projecting power around the world and, and influencing resources, depleting resources mostly. The modern era, which is basically now, um, uh, or, or up to now, and then now and in the future. So um, don't really uh, want to spend time with these, with these first two things or the future right now. So I just want to concentrate on the colonial era the modern era, and then where we are now for, for illustrative purposes for our class for right now. Questions so far? Making sense? Everybody with me? Okay. Um, so let's talk about the colonial uh, uh, era. Wait, I should, yeah, there we go. Okay, colonial era. So um, this is where we start projecting mostly European powers, mostly into areas where Europe didn't have control and then establishing control the very idea of a colony is to get stuff to your, main, to your main country, to your main territory, right? So you send out a colony to gather things, typically. And many of these things that are being gathered are abundant coastal resources. And so a couple examples of this are right here. One is the stellar sea cow, which is a manatee-like critter um, that was in um, Alaska. And that's what this illustration is showing. Um, it was first described by Europeans in 1741. Humans had been living there for thousands of years, and they hadn't gone extinct. But when the Europeans came in, they see it in 1741. By 1768, the species is completely extinct. And so this is a classic... Maybe we should turn this lights down a little bit. 
this is a classic The stellar sea cow is a classic organism that can easily be depleted. So it is, has a lot of calories, a lot of resources, a lot of blubber and all that kind of stuff, right? Moves very slowly. Hangs out in, in near shore waters. Is not out in the middle of the ocean, is not high in the top of a mountain peak. Very, very easy to see. Um, breathes air, so is at the surface all the time, or you know, frequently at, at the surface. Um, <clears throat> And so was very, very easily overexploited. What we say overexploited. So exploited is we just take something. Overexploitation, which we'll talk about later, um, is, is to the point where we're reducing the population and reducing its ability to repopulate. Izzy. Are these somehow related to stellar sea lions, or is it just some random dude's name? No, the stellar is the sea captain that described them. So they're related in that he's the one that wrote the you know, English description of them but they're not uh, uh, evolutionarily related. Um, so that's one example. Another example are our sea otters over there <clears throat> on the left. And this is a picture of a, of a regular sized dude. I mean, not, not a se seven foot basketball player, but still a regular sized dude next to sea otter pelts. These are large individuals, right? And so our sea otter population extended from Alaska all the way down past us here where, where campus is on the west coast. Um, again, the colonial era comes in and people say, ah, fur, as in sea otter, um, our sea otters are cool critters. One of the things that is uh, a challenge for them is they maintain their warmth by really, really awesomely thick fur and clean fur. And so like some animals, like the stellar sea cow is staying warm in the cold water by blubber, by essentially having um, uh, layers of fat as their insulator. The sea otters are primarily doing that with really, really dense fur that traps little bits of air and, and is a thermal barrier. And so that made these furs incredibly valuable. And so let's start killing them. And so we, we thought we drove them extinct until we found a few populations that survived. And that's what has repopulated our current uh, sea otter populations in uh, California um, since then. But, but a, a, a both very good examples of colonial exploitation. Or so the sea cow was meant to collect blubber? Yes, yes. How much bigger was it compared to today's manatee? Uh, I don't know exactly. I think it's roughly the same size. Might be a little teeny bit bigger, maybe like 10, 15 percent bigger, but it's basically like a manatee sized critter. So were the other parts of the sea cow just discarded and basically like not used properly? Uh, so, so, it so Oro's question is uh, when they were. Uh, taken out the sea cows, um, did they use all parts of it? Generally speaking, the native peoples in the areas of Alaska that would hunt these individuals would pretty much use everything. That was subsistence living. And so use the blubber for one thing, use the meat for one thing, use the bones and stuff for something else. Um, uh, on my um, 17th birthday, I was on a bowhead whale hunt in northern Alaska. Um, and those villagers use everything. So the only thing they didn't really use was the jawbones, and they used the jawbones as like an entrance to their village, uh, as like a structure, as like a decorative thing. Um, and, and that was how uh, native peoples in the south of Alaska used these guys. But the Europeans are primarily going after the blubber. Um, and so uh, I'm sure they ate the meat too, but uh, it, it, was, it was, the other thing about the colonial era here is that it's a, it's a commodity. It's turning this resource into something you can turn into cash. And so generally speaking, that's not a recipe to make use of every single last little scrap of the whatever, the tree or whatever. It's like, let's get the tree into timber. And so maybe when we cut the tree down, maybe there's, there's some wood shavings or something like that. It wasn't really interested in using the wood shavings, right? It was like, let's turn this into whatever the most high, high value item is. And that's what they did with these guys. Cool? Um, other examples of the colonial era are uh, the plantations that are established. So on land, we see, so on, on, in the ocean, we mostly see this as removing uh, populations or harvesting organisms. On land, we also harvested populations, but it was more conspicuous with the conversion of land, again, for uh, commercial uh, uh, sort of monetization of the resources. And so um, 
Uh, we could talk about uh, different, um, in the upper right, we can talk about different food. In the lower left, we can talk about sugar. In the lower right, we can talk also in Hawaii about both sugar and pineapples, right? It was industrial scale farming, right? And oftentimes employing uh, enslaved peoples or indentured peoples or, or you know, some people that did not get, have the freedom to choose and get paid a regular wage, right? This was all part of an industrial system to convert the land resources. In the place like Hawaii, it was at, they were after the water, right? Because it was really, really abundant water, very fertile soils. Hey, let's grow stuff there, um, and so on and so forth. So um, plantations are become very, very common in the coastal zone in the colonial era. When we get to the modern era, and this really starts around 1900, and this period is, is, has a couple different flavors. Uh, the progressive movement, which is pushing back on some of the um, major capital uh, control um, and concentration of the robber barons and things like that. Um, a neo-imperialism, where we, start, we, the US, starts acting like an like a imperial power, but we don't use that term, right? We, we, close it and all these things like we're helping people and we're helping the world and all this kind of stuff. But that's in effect what it oftentimes amounted to. Um, and, uh, and also the era of the, the beginning of the modern conservation movement as a, in, as a government policy uh, type of thing. And so to illustrate this right here, we have, um, and, and, and the clear, clear figure of the early era here is definitely Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, for good and for bad. He, he is, he's all over everywhere. Uh, an incredible human being, right? So he would read a book a day as president. And any of, I think uh, he read seven different languages. So he was the only president to go to the Middle East and visit a mosque and speak in Arabic. And as a president, the imams give him a, give him a, um, uh, a Quran, uh, in, uh, an original Quran, and he could read it. Right, so he was a crazy dude. He, he was an amazing person. Um, in the context of America, he was definitely in this neo-imperialism world. Right, let's project our power. And so that cartoon in the lower left is is him um, depicting um, the U.S. essentially takeover of this territory in Central America, so that we can create the Panama Canal and and all the stuff that comes with that. Um, you have that on one hand. On the other hand, we have the first beginnings in the coastal zone of pushing back on the rampant development. And so right there, that's Breton Island National Wildlife Refuge, and that's Roosevelt sitting there. He's a huge hunter. He was also a huge advocate for conservation. So this was uh, some of the first areas that were set aside, not for human recreation or aesthetics, but set aside the National Wildlife uh, Reservation System, set aside for biological conservation as a place where birds, fish, wildlife can recover from exploitation pressures or other disturbance pressures. So that's the, that's, uh, the modern era. Then we get into that, the early modern era. Then we get into after um, the World War, between World War I and World War II. And that's a period of really large scale transformation. So we have a lot of this technology that's come, and this is around the world, not just in the US, but around the world with all this technology that's burbled up for people to slaughter each other, once the war's ended, um, there's a there's a attention to um, transforming, especially the landscape. Um, and so uh, the picture down here on the bottom is Los Angeles, which doesn't look like Los Angeles. It might look like Ventura to you, right? So this is still when Los Angeles is relatively small, um, and major plans for parks and things like that, that which are mostly not uh, implemented. We have, we have a, a small semblance of the parks that were planned for Los Angeles, but um, beginning to think about this large scale um, planning. Then we hit the post-World War II era, and that is one which is really dominated by the Cold War. And so environmental concerns initially are put by the wayside, and the whole world is now orienting around another war between the Soviet Union and the Western powers. And so Concerns about pollution, concerns about um, you know, not disturbing that coastal bluff. No way, man, we're putting a gun turret up here. Or, or, or we got to dump this waste, and this waste is part of the defense industry, so don't talk about it and what have you. And so that's the era that we get DDT um, proliferating around the US. 
um, as, as thought to be a great miracle. It's also this era of science as this incredibly powerful thing. It's this era where science has given us wonders. Plastics and shampoos and microwaves. And it's all, and scientists are awesome because they only bring us cool stuff. They don't tell us the world's bad. They don't tell us that there's a problem with this. It's just all good, 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 good. Um, but it's also the era where we have this. So this is the largest dump of DDT, the largest concentration of DDT in the world on the whole planet is off of Los Angeles, off of Palos Verdes in the sediments because we dumped it. Because for decades, the factories that were producing DDT were, were there in LA. And at the end of the day, it was pull out the hose, wash the machine down. And then it went from the, the plant into the drain, the drain into the storm drain, storm drain into the creek, creek, uh, and just was basically right out into the ocean. So um, in addition to that, we also actively dumped stuff uh, in an industrial scale in the ocean. So this drum right here is an example of a DDT waste filled drum that was just dumped. We did the same thing off the Farallon Islands with radiation. We just threw a bunch of radioactive stuff in 55 gallon steel drums, literally just steel drums, and threw them into the ocean. Shocker, steel drums, ocean water, they don't, they don't stay perfect for very long. So that, that was this huge era, right, going on. And, but, but we also start to get, this is Rachel Carson, we also start to get this after a few years of like, wait a second, is this, this rampant scientist, science is perfect, don't question the government ever, da 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 Maybe there's some bad sides to that. And that leads us to the modern, the so-called golden age of environmentalism or golden age of modern environmental laws we see this flourishing late 60s into the early 70s of this almost all our foundation environmental legislature burbles up around then. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, all that stuff. Um, and, and that's spurred on. And so this picture on the right is a picture of the of folks lobbying for um, the, the proposition that would essentially start the Coastal Commission in California. Um, uh, and this was this was sort of the way the way this is sort of an, a, 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 a cartoon about uh, talking about how we do used to do our environmental impact studies after we had the impact then we went and looked and said oh it's a problem so this era was about trying to get in front of that trying to look at the impacts before they occurred and maybe not letting them happen in the first place we also have a, a series of uh, a major environmental catastrophes for us the most important one is this 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill that really, uh, we'll talk more about that later, but, but just really galvanizes everybody and something's wrong. And we get Richard Nixon starting the EPA. So I'll, I'll just reiterate, um, the Endangered Species Act was passed with no dissenting votes in the Senate. The Endangered Species Act, no dissent, not a few folks abstained, but, but no dissenting votes. The EPA was created by a, a conservative Republican president, right? It was a different time. It was a different time. Um, and so that was the golden age. And now we're in this, uh, we've sort of entered this post after the, the mid 90s and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the so-called Cold War. Um, there was a little bit of period there. We didn't know what we wanted to do. We we're kind of burbling around and military budgets started to be shrunk and all this and that. And then we have the war on terror. Uh, that, that you know, famously gets going, it was going before, but it famously gets going with 9-11, September 11th attack, 2001. And that really introduces the war on terrorism and, and sort of starts us down this illiberal worldview. And that, and that, that means that you know, we, we, we kind of enter this another Cold War thing, which is like, hey, don't question something so much because we need to do certain activities to keep us all safe or something of that nature, right? And that's where we are. So, for example, we've already meant, talked about this, but, but the top picture are the uh, uh, coral atolls being converted to a, a military base by China in the South China Sea. That's part of this sort of modern uh, new war on terror and, and pushback and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, we, the, the border fencing around um, the U.S.-Mexican border and the militarization of the border fencing and all that kind of stuff. Um, all of that is, the, is this, this sort of modern era. Where we are now is in this world that we're still figuring out, but it's clearly a post-pandemic world. And one of the hallmarkers of that world has been this idea that um, use your gut, 
use your gut. And you know, uh, science is sort of a political thing as opposed to an objective way to look at the world and all this and that. And so you get um, things like uh, people saying we shouldn't have to have public health mandates and things of that nature. Um, uh, as was uh, replete in places. These are these pictures from Orange County, but it was it was it's all over the place. Okay, so that's a little bit of the era. So now here we are now. So let's talk about our coastal ecological stressors. So these stressors, when I say stressor, I'm referring to a, a non-living or a living, an abiotic or a biotic constraint on some ecological process, on some ecological function. Okay. Um, that makes it harder for that e ecological process to happen. Uh, harder for the whales to reproduce or uh, harder for the trees to grow or, or something of that nature. What we're seeing today is a change in the nature and the magnitude and the frequency of stressors. So nature meaning the, the sort of quality, how that, how that stressor is manifesting. Magnitude meaning how intense it is, how, 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 how strong it is. And frequency, how frequently the, the, the stressor is coming. So it used to come once every 10 years, now it comes every five years or something like that. Historically, the stressors, when we think about stressors in the, in the greater coastal zone and, and near marine waters and, and, and land near the ocean and all that good stuff, um, were historically dominated by natural factors the rainfall that leads to a, a slumping hillside that you know, uh, makes PCH be blocked or something like that. Um, and that's still true, but, um, but increasingly, the human-driven stressors have grown. And those human-driven st stressors both act independently of the natural stuff and act synergistically and sort of work together with the natural stressors to create even more uh, challenges for ecological functioning in the coastal zone. And then, uh, so, yeah, so, that, so that's one part. The other part is that the scale is increasing. The, the spatial scale that these stressors are, so, so the, the, the geographic area upon which they're stressing things out is growing, as well as how, how long they last in time. Both of those things are increasing. These stressors are getting to the point um, where they're beginning to challenge the integrity of the, of the various coastal ecosystems as a whole. Um, and, they're making, and they're doing that by reducing our resiliency, we're reducing our ability to bounce back after the, after the assault happens, after the stress happens, um, or changing the um, successional pathways of those ecosystems. So, so they're so stressed so often, or they're so burnt by wildfires so frequently or whatever, instead of um, going from bare ground to grass to shrubs to trees, maybe it only goes from bare ground to grass, and we don't sort of complete that successional, traditional successional pathway. And, and the, the formal term for that is alternative stable states that we're seeing more commonly these alternative stable states. So it's not just that, hey, stop the stressor and the, the population will come back, the whales will come back, the, the whoever will come back. Um, but it's that um, stop the stressor and what we have, even, once, even if we sort of are able to stop that stressor, we're left with something different than what we had uh, historically. Make sense? Yeah. Questions? So um, uh, now uh, we will be using our poll data um, starting probably about after next week or so after we start to get, uh, after you guys have a chance to sort of type some more stuff in. But um, our poll data is fundamental to how we're going to talk about these things the rest of the class. So we talked about the poll as an instrument to help our community partners, but really, first and foremost, it's to help us. So when we talk about these issues going forward, I want you to be referencing the data you're collecting. So when we talk about oil drilling, we talk about these stressors, see, see if what I'm saying or what our, our uh, readings, is that what our local community thinks, right? And let's back that up. So to, to illustrate some of these things, I'm gonna show you guys using some of our older data. Some of these questions we still use, some of them we've sort of swapped them out for other questions, but they're all, all our you know, class collective data. 
Um, and so one of those issues is we've been asking people, and so this data is just from 2016 to 2021. There's about, about 7,000 people uh, responded here. Um, and this, we asked, um, this is a question you are also asking this semester, which is, um, uh, you know, what, what's a bigger influence? Uh, nature, or people, or both, or, or something other than those two things? And the answer is 92% of folks think that um, humans are in the mix somewhere. So, so again, it can seem like when we're looking at the news feeds or, or certain things that it's like, oh, it's act of God or I can't control it. But just about everybody thinks that we have a hand in the, the, the challenges that we're seeing. So that, that's important to start with. Another one that we're not asking because we asked it for so many years and it literally didn't change from year to year to year to year to year to year to year. To year. Um, and that is we've asked people historically to prioritize the, the threats as they see them. And we asked them about the coast overall, and that's what we'll just focus on that one. In some years, we asked about fisheries threats. Some years, we asked about threats to wetland habitats. But, but basically, coastal is the big takeaway. And what we see, which is what everybody that's done this polling since the 70s and, and public perceptions and stuff can see. And I should say that all these things have, this is all means plus one standard error. It's just the standard error is so small. So it's, there's very, very high. Uh, agreement in the general public about this from year to year, from city to city, all that kind of stuff. And so let's look at this guy. And so this is ranking their threat. So, so to this side of the graph is the highest threat. And this side over here is the, the least concern, the, the lowest threat as, as they perceive them. And what we always see is we, and, and blue here is invasive species, we always see invasive species uh, voted as the least worrying thing. We also always see pollution as the biggest problem. And not just pollution, but pollution by way, 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 way greater margins than the other things. Um, the other broad categories here are habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, so breaking up and, and converting ecosystems. And then over harvesting is, is taking, as I mentioned before, taking um, things out in such a way that the resource doesn't repopulate itself. So that could be uh, carting down too many trees, that could be sucking out too many fish or whatever. And so we consistently see the public saying pollution is the biggest threat. Uh, and then followed by destroying ecosystems and then followed by over harvesting and then followed by invasive species. Um, so, 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 you know, we will spend, so this is a great final question. This is a great final question, hint, hint, which is, this is what the public perceives this to be, the, the ranking of, let's say, pollution, habitat fragmentation, over-harvesting invasive species. Do you agree, right? And we can't answer that yet because we haven't gone over the, all the stuff we're going to cover this semester, but a great question, hint, hint, for a final question would be like, hey, does, you know, is this correct? And if so, cool, show me support. If you think the, the rank should be differently, what do you think they should be and what's your evidence, right? If that is correct. If this, what, what the general public always thinks and has thought since the 1970s and what we've been finding for over a decade here, that this is, that, that pollution is the biggest problem. When we talk about our coastal zone, pollution is the number one stressor. Okay. Um, in practice, in practice, um, these threats are um, often talked about just like this, just like this presentation, as individual things, right? As individual things. So as the person taking too many fish, as Caltrans putting a freeway down, right? Or, or something like that. Um, the reality is oftentimes these stressors are interacting with other things and they're, and they're com combining and, and, and interacting in ways that are hard to predict, so-called synergies, synergistic. That's in nature. In terms of our societal institutions, we have oftentimes conflicting priorities. So we're not in agreement as a society as to which direction the train should go. 
And we're increasingly dealing with this idea of institutional ineffectiveness, dysfunction. Harry will talk about that on Thursday in the Do Drop In. I hope you guys come to hear, hear that conversation. Um, we'll talk about how effective um, our, our, uh, one of our local agencies is with our, with our field visit on Thursday. Um, but, but this idea of effectiveness is a key thing that we have to increasingly deal with. 30 years ago, that wasn't a topic we had to talk about in, in coastal management, or, or at least it wasn't a high priority thing to talk about. Okay, so what we have is what you guys should write down is, is this sort of universe of coastal stressors to our coastal ecosystems are these um, five things. Overharvesting, pollution, habitat loss or habitat fragmentation or degradation, the introduction of things that didn't used to be here, introduced species, biological critters, and then the, the growing ineffectiveness of our coastal institutions, of our political and social construct, constructs to manage these resources. And I would put them in that order. So number one, over harvesting, number two, pollution, number three, habitat loss slash fragmentation, uh, four, introduced species, five, uh, institutional problems, institutional ineffectiveness. I'll just note that in this, in this framing of these stressors, climate change is a real thing, but that's a subset of pollution, right? I will note that most people now will sort of put that in its own category, its own, its own number, but from our first principles approach in this class, sort of like conceptual, conceptual bins, climate change is a real problem. I'm not saying it's not a, a real problem, it's a massive problem, but ultimately it's, a, it's an issue of pumping out too many too much product, in this case CO2 and methane and things like that, into the atmosphere. So, so everything like ocean acidification, uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about some of these. I mean, you guys probably know that this is, this is probably um, makes sense, but um, let's talk about over harvesting first. So um, we've asked that with when we've asked uh, people about fishing management in California. And so we've asked, hey, is the, are the, the things uh, regulating our fisheries, is that, is that the right amount of, of, uh, of um, policy, et cetera, brought to bear? The first thing to say is that most people are unsure, Gesundheit, so most people aren't sure what the fishing laws are. Most people don't fish. Um, again, 30, 40 years ago, a much larger fraction of the population either recreationally fished or commercially fished, and we have fewer and fewer people that engage in, in those types of activities, hunting and fishing and stuff. So, th so that's the first thing to say. But of the, of the folks that did have an opinion, uh, it's about split between, yeah, we're doing about the right thing and we're, we're under-regulated. And this also is important. Um, it also plays into this uh, next one, which is um, we, you are asking how this semester, how the changing California, or how has the coast changed from the 1950s to now? In this particular case, we we're asking about fisheries. And again, a large fraction of people aren't sure, aren't sure how the fisheries, California fisheries uh, changed from, you know, back in the day to now. Um, but when they did have an opinion, most people thought it was, the fisheries are worse off, right? By a really strong margin, by a really strong margin. With endangered species laws, um, folks talked about, um, here's one where people are not as, are not as um, unsure. So whereas some of our things, when we ask about specific policies, you know, a lot of people, ah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I don't know. But endangered species is one that a large number of folks have an opinion of, or, or so they feel like they at least know a little something about endangered species laws. Um, and the vast majority of, or, or I should say the majority of people think it should be expanded, or, uh, or if we add expanded or not changed, it is... Um, the vast majority of the population. The energy is all over here. The energy is all, in terms of what you read in the newspaper and stuff, it's all about eliminating, changing, reducing, et cetera. But the public, generally speaking, seems fairly content with that. 
Um, and I'll skip over Steelhead for now. Um, or maybe I shouldn't skip over Steelhead. So we, we, we're not asking this one, but since I have another question in here. So some years we rank, um, I'll give them a whole list of different policies, detailed policies, and say good, bad, and different, whatever. And we have them, and in this case, they, they score, they rank from two, which is super awesome, to minus two, which is super bad. And um, uh, steelhead recovery efforts um, fall out at, in the pretty good range. So people seem to be pretty happy, generally speaking, um, with that in our relativistic score. So that, that's how some folks think of overharvesting. If we talk about pollution, we're not asking this anymore because this, this policy got challenged and has had some legal things and is, and is modified and changed. But when it was going strong, we, um, we asked about it. Uh, this is still California policy, but, but things got really different from the original conceptualization. So this was the first conceptualization of California's CO2 cap and trade. Um, most people don't know anything about cap and trade. So about two thirds of the public are like, what the hell is cap and trade? I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't. So, okay, good. So cap and trade is um, a policy that was offered by um, free market economists when people um, originally started talking about um, stopping a pollutant. And the idea is instead of saying don't make that pollutant, just essentially make it costly to use that pollutant. And so in this case, um, this is how we dealt with, uh, for example, sulfur and acid rain. And so when we, when, uh, you know, 25 years ago, when people were talking about a carbon tax, taxing the carbon emissions, um, the free market economists said, oh, the taxes are horrible, don't tax. So instead, create a cap and trade. So we cap the total amount of emissions of CO2. And, and you, as a polluter, um, in, in a, this is, I'm talking about a generic cap and trade framework here. You, as a polluter, can emit a certain amount of, you know, 100 units of pollution, right? And that's all. And once you let 100 units go out, you can't, you can't release anymore. But maybe all of us in the room have 100 units. And maybe Aura is like really, really good, and she's reduced her pollution. So she's only emitting 50, yeah, raw. She's only doing 50 units of pollution, right? But maybe my industry is much harder to reduce, right? And so she, can now turn that 50 units of pollution into a commodity and sell it to me, and I can buy it. So then I can emit 150 units of pollution, but not be, but not be illegal, right? But not be violating the law. And so, so in other words, we cap the total amount of emissions as a society or as a, as a region or as a whatever. And then we, we are, we're allowed to move those pollution credits around, and then over time, that cap is going to shrink, right? So it's going to start with like a thousand units, and then, you know, next year it's going to go to 950, and the year after 9, so that eventually we, we reduce it. So that's the idea of cap and trade, um, with regards to emissions from the state of California. So that's our plan. The hope had been to have a giant, continent-wide market. As it was, we started with California, and now just a few other collaborators are in our in our market. But that's what it is. Somebody had a question. Somebody else had a hand up. Is he? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Is that problematic, though? I, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying this is, this is a desirous thing to do. I'm just saying this is a California, this is a policy, a management choice that our legislature has made to try to deal with things like some of these stressors that are, we're going to be perceived as more wildfires, rising sea levels, et cetera. Stephen. Yes, so there's been a lot of studies on how to do cap and trade um, more effectively. There, there's, there's all kinds of potential downsides here. I'm, I'm not advocating for this policy or saying it's horrible. I'm just saying this, this, this is our state policy. And so we're asking, uh, this is a pollution management policy. So what does the public think about that? You said it changed, what changed? Um, let's talk more about that later. Uh, this was just an example of pollution. but. <laughs> But it's, so I, did, I didn't mean to go into a whole lecture on CO2, but, but um, uh, essentially how we authenticate, 
how we show that something, that the credit is really real. The other big problem, a lot of environmental justice communities have uh, made the argument. So for example, our work with that machine in the back, that air quality monitoring, which is part of our air pollution monitoring network across Ventura County, that's funded by the renewal of our um, uh, landmark climate change legislation in the state. And that is funded as an environmental justice thing. So we're as an environment to address environmental inequalities and pollution burdens being disproportionately borne by communities that are historically bearing a huge amount of pollution. And so the argument has been, this is working at the, at the large level. This is working at the level of the state to help us not grow our emissions, reduce our emissions, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> There's some questions as to how fast it's, it's reducing, but nevertheless. But it's, it's happening, but the Oxnard air quality isn't getting better, right? The South LA air quality isn't getting better. The Richmond air quality isn't getting better. So the state overall is doing well, but um, it's allowing the dirtiest of polluters to keep polluting. And those tend to be in our communities that, that bear a disproportionate layer of that pollution. So that's one of the, I mean, so there, there's various, various criticisms, but those are a couple. Those are a couple of the critiques. Um, okay, so, the, but the point here is people are like, eh, I don't know. This is a major policy to deal with climate change that all you guys are like, oh my God, this is a huge thing, right? Two thirds of the public don't know about it, or, or at least don't know about it to have an opinion. And the rest are pretty close to evenly split. Pretty close to evenly split between good, bad, you know, uh, or not sure. Um, when we ask the public, uh, now this is up to 2021, and this is of about 15,000 people, um, is climate change a serious problem? Uh, uh, 78, or about 79% say yes. This fluctuates based on, any, any guesses as to what, from year to year, but it, it's, all, it's all around here, but anybody want to guess as to what the thing that maybe makes it go up or down? Media, but but uh, but uh, but something about the year. I don't know if this is right, but it's like whoever's in power in terms of like government. Like election years, specifically presidential election years, make this number go down slightly. So when we have people screaming about how like blah 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 blah, this will drop down a percentage or two. In years when it's not a presidential year, it'll creep up a, a few percentages. Um, and that, and that's, we see the same thing with the Yale data, we see the same thing with the Harvard data, we see the same thing with people around the country that do this in their respective places. So, um, but the point is, the bigger point is, check it out. The vast, 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 you know, 80% of the public are like, yep, it's a serious problem. You don't get, I, well, you tell me. But when you look at the news, I don't think you get the impression that 80% of the people are like, yep, we're all in agreement on this, right? What you're hearing is you're hearing about these 10% of the people that are like, no, 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 the sky, the earth is flat, and the sky is purple, and you know, I'm rich, or whatever the hell they're saying. Right, right. But it's important for you guys to understand that some of our coastal management issues, the public is unsure. They're confused. They don't know about this policy, which is, you know, which is what it is. There's a different approach you would take to engaging that management issue if people don't know about it. Versus if 80% of the people in the room are like, yo, let's do this. That's a different, you can start from a different point. You don't have to start from the basics. We can say, okay, yes, it's a problem. Let's talk about how we're gonna respond to the problem and put our energy into that as opposed to delay, 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 confusion, 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 anger, 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 you know, bonk each other in the head, bonk each other in the head, Izzy. Historically, it has, but again, when it decreases, it's a couple percent. It's not like, it doesn't go to like 60% or something like that. It, it stays very, very high. Even, and, oh, yeah, go ahead, no, please. Well, even with Biden, he has such a low approval rating right now. Do you think that's gonna even have a higher factor in terms of that number? I think, uh, I think the burning of Lahaina, I think the massive storms that are whipping New England the last week or two, um, those things are having, uh, are beginning to have at least as much influence as that political stuff. So, it, it, so th things are, the number over time is growing, right? The number over time is growing. 
Um, and then we've sometimes, in some years, asked, uh, so one, this one question uh, we've been asking since we've been doing this is, is climate change a serious problem we should, we should you know, we should, uh, a serious problem we should take seriously or, or address, uh, address? Some years we ask, hey, is climate change playing a role in one of these things? And when we ask those things, um, we get uh, a lot of people think that drought, flooding, uh, uh, you know, all various things, increasingly things that are, you know, 20 years ago would be harder to pin on your home price, insurance rates, those things. People are increasingly seeing that climate change, not saying it's 100% the story, but it has, it's playing a role in influencing that aspect of our society. So more and more people are seeing that not only climate change is a serious thing sort of abstractly, but in a more tangible thing that they experience on a, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Okay, overharvesting, pollution. What about uh, habitat loss? What about fragmentation and all that kind of stuff? And, and in here I would, I would just, um, uh, so yeah, for the pollution, I didn't, I didn't say it clearly, but pollution, um, we can talk about proximate pollution, which is most of the stuff we're talking about, the heat plumes and stuff, and then climate change, which is, which I, I do understand that it's a pretty big bin, and so we kind of oftentimes talk about quote unquote generic pollution and climate change pollution. With habitat loss, same thing, general degradation and general uh, uh, transformation of landscapes. And then in particular, we should talk about coastal development because a lot of our attention is in that, co is when we have a landscape and convert it to a house or something of that nature in the immediate coastal zone. And so for a long time, we asked people, uh, uh, did, has, do you think the amount of wetlands within 50 miles of your house have changed in the last 150 years? And uh, the vast majority of people, two thirds, uh, said we would consistently year to year to year say like, yeah, it's gone down. There used to be more wetlands than there are now. Um, and when we, but when we asked them the amount, and again, this is, everybody pay attention to this because this, this is a key aspect of our poll of, of sort of resource management polling in general. So, so and this is correct, this is, this is real. So people, the vast majority of people get that there used to be more wetlands. But then when we ask them, okay, cool, uh, tell me more specifically, in this case, specifically about the quantity change of wetlands within 50 miles of your house. Um, uh, and what you get is, there's sort of, check it out, it's a fairly even distribution, 16, 28, 27, 20, right? So people are kind of all around. This is the right answer. So the right answer is um, uh, California as a whole has lost um, about 91% of our historic wetlands. And so, um, so while people uh, will oftentimes get the broad strokes correct or, or, the, or the broad idea, almost everybody gets the, the quantity or the magnitude uh, incorrect, right? And that's, that's not to say they're stupid, they're busy, they're doing their lives, they're doing stuff. But Again, when we talk about arguing for a different resource management issue, it's a different thing if you go into the room and people think that we lost 10% of our wetlands versus if you go into an audience that thinks that we've lost 90% of our wetlands, right? So it's one thing to say, oh, we lost a little bit of this stuff and that sucks and I don't wanna lose that, but you know, I got other priorities versus saying almost everything is gone already so that these remnant resources are that much more rare and that much more valuable. So we wanna both understand where people are coming from, but also as much as we can, when, when you're entering into these discussions with you know, your uncle at Thanksgiving dinner or whenever, is you know, what are they, let's check the assumptions, right? Before we start yelling at each other or getting upset, like let's see, you know, are we on the same page? And a lot of times we wanna start on the same page and that's the first part of before we get into the specifics. Um, okay, introduced species. We don't have any questions about introduced species on this year's uh, survey, but in general, um, talking about the removal of feral animals on Channel Islands, which we've asked in years past, um, uh, people are generally happy about pulling feral animals out. Invasive species pulling gets really hard because the terminology is very triggering for folks. Exotic, invasive, non-native, it, 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 it's hard in our sort of brief polling. It's better to do that in a focused invasive species poll. Um, so it's, it's been a little bit hard over the years to look at that. But, but generally speaking, people are supportive of uh, issues related to controlling invasive species. And then we can talk about institutional ineffectiveness. And I would say this is, this is 
uh, two broad bins in here in terms of the stressors are um, the, just the basic overlap, the basic nature of the coastal zone it, in itself is inherently challenging to manage. So everybody's on top of each other and everybody's on top of each other and everybody's on top of each other. So the shippers want to drive their ships over the area where the fishermen want to fish, which is where the surfers want to surf and where the homeowners want to see a, a pretty view, right? So that, that sort of just inherent nature, we're all concentrated in this, in this relatively narrow zone. So the first level of, of challenge comes from us being on top of each other all the time. And then my agency that's about promoting fishing and your agency that's about, I don't know, promoting recreation or whatever, we're, we sometimes are working at opposite uh, goals, right? Even within the same government or the same institution or something. And then the other, uh, then the other broad category of institutional ineffectiveness is different value structure, different views as to what is appropriate use. So not just that we're all in the same place, but some people just think we shouldn't fish at all, or fishing is inherently bad. And other people thinking that fishing is inherently great, and we should be doing fishing every day of the week, right? So, so that uh, is the, at the core of our ineffectiveness. Somebody had a question? No. Okay, and so when we, and this is, here's another key theme that will emerge from our polling. One is we say, hey, so um, are we doing, uh, uh, actually, I'm gonna start with the bottom one first. So um, are, do we have, is, are we managing our coastal area well, right? So again, the, a lot of people unsure, but when people vote, they almost always say we're doing a bad job. And now this is not only coastal, this is about resource management in general. Hey, how are we doing with the forests? Hey, how are we doing with, uh, I don't know, air pollution or w whatever the thing is. And when we, I shouldn't say air pollution, that's not right. I would say, how are we doing with um, land management in the Western US? Something like that, right? People will say, invariably, and we've seen this year upon year upon year, um, they'll say, in general, either they're unsure, but when it comes to people that have an opinion, the negative opinion is strong. Meaning people think that, in general, we're doing a crappy job. We're not managing fill in the blank well. Um, but when we start to ask them specific questions, what about the realignment of Pacific Coast Highway so it doesn't fall in the ocean or, or whatever, or the management of, uh, of the removal of in, invasive species on Santa Rosa, when we ask them specific, the general vote is much more positive. So when we have a targeted management action, I'm not saying that everybody thinks that all our management action is good, but, but comparatively speaking, the average support goes up when we're specific. When we're general, people tend to be way more negative about stuff. And so you can see that, um, one, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, you know, asking the general question, but also when we say, like, hey, should we be doing, are we doing too much, are we not doing enough? And again, a lot, a majority always say we should be doing more, which is goes along with that idea of our institutions aren't effective. So another way you can read this is our institutions have failed us in terms that more people think our institutions are doing poorly than are thinking our institutions are doing well, about two to one. Make sense? Questions so far? Okay, so I just want to end with talking a little bit about um, this idea to make sure we're all on the same page of synergy when I talk about synergy. So we were talking about uh, stressors. A lot of times we will talk about an individual stressor in this class because we want to illustrate the point and talk about the thing. But it's important you always remember that in practice, these, these stressors are, are acting in the real world when other things are also potentially bumping up against our, our thing. Okay. And so, um, so what is synergism? So let's have a look at this, at this graph here. Okay. So this is from a, a, a recent study where people were looking at um, factors that were harming or potentially harming coastal wetlands. In this case, it's on the East Coast, but it, it's, it serves the purpose, right? And so they were asking, hey, what are, and so in this case, they're looking at a couple different things for this example. They were looking at sea level rise. Obviously, when the sea, le when sea level goes up, the plants are terrestrial plants, even though they, they can hang out in water, they can't be completely submerged all the time. Our, our pickle weeds and, 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 and um, uh, uh, salt grasses and things like that. Okay, so one of the stressors is sea level rise. The other are 
herbaceous uh, herbivory from crabs. So crabs going in and, and essentially clipping the clipping off the pieces of the plants, right? So they went and they we took a bunch of detailed measurements, and 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 so they looked at the wetlands that were disappearing, and they attributed um, you know how much was because of this factor, how much because of that factor, and so what, you, what they found is with sea level rise. Oops, can you guys see this? Sea level rise, sea level rise when they just measured sea level rise by itself, that was about 13 percent of the loss of the wetlands were due to sea level rise, and then totally separately, um, when they looked at herbivory and critters munching on the, on the shoots and things, they found about the same number. They found about 14% of the wetland loss was in areas where they have high concentrations of, of crabs. And so this would be analogous to our talking about climate change in isolation or talking about over-harvesting in isolation. Everybody with me? But... Um, uh, and, and so, so, okay, so let's say these things are going on. If we think that these entities act separate from one another, independent of one another, we would say, oh my gosh, Dr. A, we have sea level rise going on in this area and we have herbivores going on in this area, right? So since they're both going, let's add the two together. So one is 13% uh, and one's 14%. So we call that additive, right? So we take thing A and add to thing B and total them up and sum and put it at the bottom of the sheet and what's the answer? So we'd say, oh, we predicted we would have 27% loss of our, of our wetlands in this study region, okay? In fact, when they looked at it together, they found 86% loss. And so what's going on there is it's not, it's, it's not like some theoretical mathematical model where A is being added to B. There is reality. There is ecological interaction. There is dynamicism from the water flow and all these other things that combine together. So when they have these two things together, you in fact lose 86% of the wetland. So that's what we mean by synergy. Now synergy, can, in other words, in other words the, the actual manifestation on the system is not linear, is not additive. It is it is multiplicative. It is, it is, it, it's, it's hard to predict this. So is it like compounding? Yes. Or confounding? Like there are other factors? Okay. So Ashley's question is, so is this, is this making the bar bigger? Or is, is it kind of ca uh, counteracting it maybe? Um, so maybe, I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to make an example how that could work. Maybe, maybe, um, Maybe when the sea level rises, maybe fish come in and eat all the, and can eat the crabs better. So actually the sea level rise is gonna kinda counteract the, the crab grazing maybe. Right? You can think, but I, I suppose that could be happening. Um, so so the, the synergism isn't necessarily always positive. Sometimes they, they, they act to, to you know, counteract each other. But in most cases, what we tend to see in most coastal systems is when there's a synergism, it's, it's magnifying the impact. The reduction of the population, the, the erosion rates are increasing much faster, you know, whatever it is. And so then the rest of her question is, what's the mechanism for this? We do not, we do not understand. I, was, I tried to figure some of this stuff out for my PhD years ago, didn't really, I, I, could, I could show a pattern, but I, didn't, I, I still don't understand the mechanism. And this is, this is a huge area of research. Stephen. Yes, what I'm saying is that the way we historically approach stuff, the way our science has evolved, all your capstones, for example, right? Either your capstones you guys have done or your capstone you're gonna do. I'm wondering if, fill in the blank. Uh, I don't know, rainfall influences the plastic. I'm wondering if um, uh, the side of the mountain that we're at on Santa Rosa Island influences the, the oak trees, right? All totally legit things to do, all great work you guys do, all super cool. But that's how we do it, right? That's how you do it. Like, hey, does the sl slope of the mountain matter? These synergies or these interactions say we probably need to look at both the slope and the temperature and the storm rate and that, right? And so it's just a lot, logistically, it's a lot harder to do interaction studies than it is to do the single factor ones. And so that doesn't invalidate the single factor ones, but it just gives us a cautionary tale. 
right? So generally it says, so if we did this and we said, oh my gosh, this, the sea level is knocking out 13% of our wetlands, you should always in the back of your mind say probably something like at least 13%, right? It could be a lot higher. And so that's all I'm saying, is that um, sometimes we trick ourselves and when we see this as in policy, where we have these really strong, we're really scared of something, climate change, how are we going to respond to it? Oh my gosh, well, let's do something. And the people don't want to do something. We finally do something. We go, what are we going to do? Well, the, let's manage as if the sea is going to rise one meter, right? And in reality, it's probably going to rise like three meters or four meters, but that's sort of hard for people to swallow. So sometimes we, we, we use these single stressor studies to sort of open the conversation, but it's just important you guys realize that oftentimes uh, that's a, that's a, a floor on the estimate, not, not a, you know, robust of exactly how it's going to play out. Does that make sense? This is another example from same thing of stressors. It doesn't matter. It's with pollution and temperatures, same idea, um, and, and same idea. Um, and so uh, this is a last example. This is from um, up in Alaska. And this guy's look, these guys were looking at interaction strength and trying to predict interaction strength. And I'll just say that it's, a, it's an active area of research. And it's a great thing to get into. Um, it's really important for predicting future system states and stuff, but it's a, it's a non-trivial thing. And, it's, and it's, it's, it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, 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 effort to go into really understand the synergisms. Um, that, again, that doesn't invalidate the single factor, but, but most of these stressors seem to be interacting synergistically. Okay. Um, so I'll take a quick second. And I want you guys to chat with each other and see if you can come up with some um, uh, synergy. Let's just do inside California. Let's see if, uh, talk to your, your buds around you, three, four, or five people, and just chat for a minute and see if you guys can come up with any examples of synergisms in terms of coastal systems, um, stressors, synergistic stressors uh, here in California. Ready, set, go. Right. Okay, okay, good. So, uh, so, um, uh, human filling in of wetlands and then physical uh, abrasion or something of the, of, the, of the system. Okay, what about some other ones? Without sea otters and doesn't swim, like, uh, makes storms more intense and all that stuff. Okay, yeah, so, so um, you're talking about a trophic cascade there when one part of the ecosystem gets kind of whacked and then that leads to sort of a change and a change and a change and a change. But, um, but also there about the, um, the changing animals which are influencing the algae and then the, the shore is more exposed and so all those things sort of working together so that the impact on the coastline is more than you would predict from just like pulling out the sea otters like we think that oh if we just pull some sea otters out of this area nothing really changes that much but with when all these things together we pull them out and maybe we start seeing shoreline erosion kind of thing okay good other ones okay good so good so i think you guys get the idea so we'll often, again, to reiterate, we will oftentimes, we'll oftentimes reference individual stressors, but keep in the back of your mind that in practice, these things are, are interacting and being combined with other things. And then uh, just to um, examples of some of the, uh, the priorities, so some of the political aspects that we're dealing with, um, there's always competition for resources, right? Different, different players out there. Uh, there's always, and particularly in the coastal zone, it's competition for actual space. If we're up in the Sierras, we might be able to shift over, you know, 10 miles or something like that. It might be okay. But in the coast, the, the real estate just on the ocean of the land and the land just in of the ocean, it, that's where it is, right? We, that's where everybody wants to be. So we, it's a very, very intense spatial competition. Um, it's often the case that one of the parties using their resource or doing their activity is gonna harm another user or another resource. So the fact that the shipping channel folks are using the shipping channel, they're getting a benefit, but that's gonna mean that the fisher folks can't fish in that area. So by definition, they, they can't do their activities. We can't do many of these things simultaneously, even though we're trapped in a very small space. And, uh, and that leads, uh, similarly, the, the entities that then regulate that resource, trade, commerce, uh, recreation, whatever, 
um, oftentimes they have conflicting priorities. And so that, that makes the, the policy more challenging. And then, of course, as we mentioned before, we um, increasingly seem to have conflicting values as to what we value in terms of the, the coastal zone or the coastal resources. Here are some examples of institu institutional ineffectiveness. Our trip on Thursday, we will see some examples. Um, I, we'll probably talk about some ineffectiveness, but they're probably mostly going to talk about the effectiveness of these really um, pretty darn effective agencies. But nevertheless, let's talk about a couple examples here. And, and we will, uh, these, some of these might not make as much sense, but we're just sort of setting them up for later in the semester. For one is a local, LCP stands for Local Coastal Plan. We'll learn about that when we talk about the Coast Commission. But essentially, that's a, that's a, a plan to, or, or what's, a, what's permitted in the immediate coastal zone, right? What, what, what types of building activities or, or whatever are allowed to go on. We started requiring these in the 1980s. So before the 1980s, we didn't even have that. Right now, many of our local coastal plans are massively out of date. So many of the, of the, the governing blueprint for what we're going to do in the coastal zone were generated 30 or 40 years ago, right? Not with the era of climate change, not with the era of, that we're in now, et cetera. Um, and it takes decades often to update those plans. It's not just like a year or two. It it's, can be long, long, long term. Uh, we, are, we are inching towards being able to do offshore energy here in California, off Humboldt, off San Luis Obispo. Inching towards. Um, we already have stuff in the water in Oregon. We already have stuff in the water in Mexico, much of which is designed here in California. But our institutions have not been able to really get this thing permitted. It's like all these reasons why we can't, all these reasons why we can't, all these reasons why we can't. And so as a consequence, we don't have, we have a very immature offshore wind energy, even though that's low carbon and all that kind of stuff. Another example of this uh, is, are, are the, um, fact that our environmental laws, which are, which are great in many respects and have, have done some good stuff, have also done some bad stuff. And one of the things they've allowed is they've allowed nimbyism to m metastasize in California. So nimbyism, remember, is not in my backyard. And so, so that's like, well, we don't want to have that apartment complex because it blocks my view. And we don't want that because it affects traffic. And, and as a consequence, that's meant we don't have as much affordable housing as we should have in and around our communities. right? And while there's different reasons for that, I think that's an example of institutional ineffectiveness, right? Not being able to both protect the environment and, you know, let's say, create housing opportunities for folks. Um, today, or the other day when I checked, uh, we're less than 10 ships anchored outside of the port of LA Long Beach, waiting to come in, waiting to their turn to get to the dock. But if you remember, a couple years ago, there were well over 80 when I, was, when I gave this lecture. Um, and at one point, there were over 100 vessels uh, anchored. That's not supposed to be. And so that was because our shipping infrastructure was getting out of whack during the pandemic. right? And so that's an example of institutional ineffectiveness to manage, in this case, coastal shipping. One of the reasons, the reason, the approximate reason we had the Huntington Beach oil spill it's very clear, is a ship dragged an anchor. Because that because all the places for these ships to, to tie to anchor up, their normal parking zones, were full. And so these massive numbers of, it would be like going to the Super Bowl, trying to park at the whatever stadium during Super Bowl weekend, right? Or park at the mall at Christmas. Like all the lots are full, and so people are in the streets and whatever. And that's what was going on with our ships. And that led to somebody dragging an anchor, ripping open a pipeline, and, and causing that oil spill. Abalone poaching is rampant. Again, more on that when we, when we get to talking about abalone. Um, but uh, uh, we have laws, but not everybody respects the laws. And so, so that, that's a policy failure, too, if we're creating guidelines that people don't follow. Um, mariculture is closing across California. We, um, when I started teaching this class, we had, I'm trying to remember, I think we had 12 mariculture facilities or something like that, 12. No. I think we had 20 mariculture facilities across California. Now we're down to like nine, I think. What is mariculture? Mariculture is the growing of things in seawater. So, uh, so growing algae. 
growing uh, abalone, growing um, uh, uh, any kind of critter that's in, if it's in water, we would just use, say aquaculture, but when it touches a salt water or salty water, we call that mariculture. Again, more on that later. But that's that, that the issue of managing our mariculture industry is a problem. That should be a way that we can get more protein from the sea and more protein to feed people, and we've been seemingly doing everything we can to kill that industry in California. Um, more, why? Hold that question. We'll talk about it when we get to that. Um, and then in general, our water supply is going down. We're getting fewer and fewer water supplies from things like the Colorado River, uh, elsewhere, right? We were over sucking our groundwater, and so that's another case of institutional inefficiency and not being able to manage, in this case, water, uh, uh, drink, potable water in the coastal zone. So those are just, uh, more of those later, but those are just examples of potential institutional ineffectiveness. And then to wrap up here, I'll just say that there's, there can seem to be a mis mis mismatch here between the threats and our response to them. The threats are seeming, as I'm telling you today, because this, this is the lecture on stressors, so it seems super scary, you know, as a, but that they, they're more, they seem to be more ubiquitous, coming faster, easier to get going, these problems. Um, and sometimes more complicated when they, when they manifest themselves, um, it can seem like our tools haven't advanced as quickly. So the threats are getting more and more like, you know, developed, but our responses maybe aren't developing quite as fast. And so um, I would say that we do have some things that are developing fast to respond to this that might not be apparent to you. So it's just a little bit of, a, of an example of, of something that seems like we're not keeping pace, but, we're actually, but are actually growing to meet the need of the, the growing threats. Citizen science. So when I started in my graduate career, citizen science was a joke. Nobody took it seriously. It's what little kid fourth graders do. And it's like, well, you make you feel good about science, right? But it wasn't viewed as something that could actually help understand a system. It wasn't viewed as something that could help improve management. Now, I think just about everybody, at least all the people that matter, uh, see it as a powerful tool and one key way to get the kind of data we can't otherwise get. And so using uh, volunteers to collect stuff, using uh, you know, trained, uh, interested parties, really, really useful to help us understand both the impact, but also potential management. Is that working? Another example of something that's really grown in sophistication, especially in the last 15 years, is attribution science. So just when we talked about that last example, oh my gosh, the, the, sea, the salt marsh is going away, right? Most high profile the attribution science is applied in the context of climate change. But, but uh, the idea there is why did this happen, right? So in the case of wildfires in Lahaina, in the case of the hurricane striking Florida or whatever, um, what you'll get is people say, oh, is this, is this the climate change caused this hurricane? And increasingly, what we can say, and increasingly you can do this very fast, and so there are strike teams now of scientists that are assembled that are attribution science experts. And they say, okay, this particular storm that hit this part of Florida on this date with this strength and, and all that kind of stuff, that if we had not had the amount of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere that we have right now, we would have had a 10% chance of that storm happening that way. Given that we've put this much pollution in the air and are, are changing the, you know, all the different factors about the atmosphere and the ocean, um, you know, that's what's going on here. So we never say that it's a climate change or this one human anthropogenic factor caused it, but we can get a much better estimate of the likelihood of it happening with or without our previous actions. So that's a really sophisticated tool that is growing in sophistication um, almost at the pace of the threats. So that's a great thing. And then I would say another one that um, is sort of uh, to be discussed later is ideas of non-policy things, non-policy, non-science responses, cultural responses, society responses to these threats. So we sometimes get caught in the trap thinking that only you and I, only the scientist, only the government agency or whatever can do the management or, or can, can influence the goings on. And what's going on now with insurance rates across Florida, Texas, California, Louisiana, is showing that, hey, when these companies start to get serious about climate change, um, it's gonna really lead to change behaviors, right? 
Um, now, it might not be the change that we want to see, but the point is that that's a powerful force that can influence and can respond to some of these threats. Um, maybe that's not the most just way and the most equitable way, having a company decide what to do, but it is true that, these, that their tools are growing. Okay, so then just, so then just to uh, wrap up and to leave us not totally depressed, to leave us not totally depressed here, uh, so these are the questions you mentioned. So the overarching question, maybe you should jot down, is has the coastal zone become too complex to manage? And we had a couple different flavors of that, right? The natural world being too unpredictable, we're not, we're not smart enough, or our institutions are too inept, right? Those things. But I would say, um, really? I would say no. I would say it's a matter of our will and a matter of working hard, putting a lot of time and effort and energy and, and you know, it's not easy, but we can do it. What's this? This is what we used to call a pineapple express. So we used to call the big wet storms that whacked us in fall, Christmas time, whatever, mostly coming out of the wet tropics that would bring a huge dump of rain. Now we have a whole forecasting center at UC San Diego with over 100 people whose full-time job is just to tell us what's going on with this. The prediction for um, and now we call these atmospheric rivers. We don't call them Pineapple Express anymore, these atmospheric rivers. We have just like, hey, hey, what's the probability of rain today? What's the probability of sunshine today? We have what's the probability of having an atmospheric river today? And those predictions aren't just what the, what the, um, uh, excuse me, what the rain is gonna do, but it's also potential damage to you and me, potential erosion that will come along. Very sophisticated, really cool. We figured that out. We figured that out, and that's now reported daily and it's freely available to everyone. So too unpredictable? No, we can figure that one out. How about too unimaginative? This is a nonprofit that uses drones and, and machine learning to automatically classify pollution that's washed up on shores or in a distant area. So if you and I went out to count all that stuff, we'd be there for days, right? Picking this stuff up, loving it back to the lab, counting it. Um, so this is uh, a machine learning algorithm that, that's, that started to count how much fishing net is there, how much this, how much is that. So um, we're too unimaginative? I don't think so. This is a citizen science thing. This is interested public people doing this. Uh, it's um, called Ellipsis Earth. Is an, it's an NGO based out of the UK. Um, uh, and, and, you know, with too impotent? I don't think so, right? Talking about now, in some parts of the country, it seems like we're still super impotent, but in dealing with stuff like uh, policies in the wake of George Floyd, right? Um, we've not fixed the problems, we've not solved stuff, but people are having much deeper conversations about what, how we should go forward, right? And this idea that we just can't do anything and we just have to let things be the way they've always been, many of us, many of you have said, nope, I don't think so going to be hard, but let's actually change the existing state of things so we can do that. And we have all, we have all kinds of examples. Yeah, I always hear too much work, it's too hard to do, da, da, da. Yeah, we can do it. Um, I'll save that for later. Um, but most recently, eight, uh, you know, billions of vaccine doses, right? Even in the time when all the people were saying, the vaccine, the blah, 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 it's like a conspiracy, whatever. So we still were able to push out these vaccines um, there were problems about getting the, these vaccines to some of the poorest regions of the planet, but overall, this was a massive success. This was a massive success. The, one of the key innovations of this was somebody that submitted her paper to a journal, and it was rejected seven times. People said, oh, that science isn't really, uh, that's, not, that's, not, uh -huh, that, that's not worthy of publishing in our journal. That became foundational in the early days of trying to characterize um, the, the virus and then form, um, form the, the vaccine. So we can do this. Um, ozone, the ozone layer, right? It seemed too crazy to deal with. You guys don't remember this because before your time, but it was like, it's gonna happen, it's done, nobody can stop it. This is one of the metrics that's improving year over year over year. So we've reduced the, the threats to the ozone layer and that's a massive success. And then um, things are super complex. We can talk about what's going on in Ukraine right now, right? This big, massive power that was supposed to destroy the world and could impose their will and is gonna crush this small little country. Of course, Ukraine is still struggling and there's problems, but these are citizen folks mostly now 
most of the army has been nuked by this fighting. And so it's mostly general Joe Blow, regular folks that are out there doing stuff. And, and this massive empire force has been stopped, right? This massive Russian thing. So, so I'm just saying that, that you know, I know this stuff seems scary at times. We can respond. We've done it with vaccines. We've done it with the ozone layer, all those kinds of things. And so, so sometimes this stuff seems scary. Sometimes it seems like we're going down. Um, but we have the ability. We got us into these challenges. We helped craft many of these stressors. We can get us out of these problem areas.